Part 8. The Specific Anarchist Organization. The Anarchist Organization. In this text, we have sometimes discussed the specific anarchist organization and our expectations in relation to it. As we have earlier defined, its objective is to, quote, to build the popular organization and influence it, giving it the desired character and to reach libertarian socialism by means of the social revolution, end quote. Further, we understand this as the political level of activity. The specific anarchist organization is the grouping of anarchist individuals who, through their own will and free engagement, work together with well-defined objectives. For this, it uses forms and means in order that these objectives are achieved, or that, at least, it proceeds towards them. Thus, we can consider the anarchist organization as, quote, the set of individuals who have a common objective and strive to achieve it. It is natural that they understand each other, join their forces, share the work, and take all measures suitable for this task." End quote. Through the anarchist organization, anarchists articulate themselves at the political and ideological level. In order to put into practice revolutionary politics and to devise the means, the way of working, that should point to the final objectives, social revolution and libertarian socialism. This political practice, which seeks the final objectives, should be carried out, quote, creating an organization that can fulfill the task of anarchism, not only in times of preparing the social revolution, but also afterwards. Such an organization must unite all the revolutionary forces of anarchism and immediately concern itself with the preparation of the masses for the social revolution and with the struggle for the realization of the anarchist society. End quote. This organization is founded on fraternal agreements, both for its internal functioning as for its external action, without having relations of domination, exploitation, or alienation in its midst, which constitute a libertarian organization. The function of the specific anarchist organization is to co coordinate, converge, and permanently increase the social force of anarchist militant activities providing a tool for solid and consistent struggle, which is a fundamental means for the pursuit of the final objectives. Therefore, quote, it is necessary to unite and to organize, first to discuss, then to gather the means for the revolution, and finally to form an organic whole that, armed with its means and strengthened by its union, can, when the historical moment is sounded, sweep all of the aberrations and all the tyrannies of the world away. The organization is a means to differentiate yourself of detailing a program of ideas and established methods, a type of uniting banner to embark in combat, knowing those with whom you can count and having become aware of the force at one's disposal." End quote. To constitute this tool of solid and consistent combat, it is essential that the anarchist organization has well-determined strategic, tactical, and political lines, which occur through theoretical and ideological unity, and the unity of strategy and tactics. This organization of well-defined lines joins the, anarchist, joins the anarchists at the political and ideological level, and develops their political practice at the social level, which characterizes an organization of active minority seeing as though the social level is always much larger than the political level. This political practice takes shape when the anarchist organization of active minority performs social work in the midst of the class struggle. Seeking social insertion, which takes shape from the moment that the anarchist organization manages to influence the social movement with which it works. Properly organized as an active minority, the anarchists constitute a much larger social force in relation to the in realization of social work and have a greater chance of having social insertion. Besides social work and insertion, the specific anarchist organization performs other activities, the production and reproduction of theory, anarchist propaganda, political education, conception and implementation of strategy, political and social relations, and resource management. So we can say that the activities of the specific anarchist organization are 
Social Work and Insertion, Production and Reproduction of Theory, Anarchist Propaganda, Political Education, Conception and Implementation of Strategy, Social and Political Relations, Resource Management. These activities can, can be performed in a more or less public way, always taking into account the social context in which it, the organization, operates. We say more or less public because we believe that, quote, one should do publicly what it is agreed that everyone should know, and secretly that which it is agreed should be hidden, end quote. In times of less repression, the anarchist organization operates publicly, performing the greatest propaganda possible and trying to attract the largest number of people. In times of increased repression, if, quote, for example, a government forbids us to speak, to print, to meet, to associate, and we do not have the strength to rebel openly, we would try to speak, to print, to meet, and to associate clandestinely, end quote. In this work, which varies according to the social context, the specific anarchist organization must always defend the interests of the exploited classes, because we understand it as a political expression of these interests. For us, the ideas of anarchism, quote, are nothing if not the purest and most faithful expression of popular instincts. If they do not correspond with these instincts, they are false, and to the extent that they are false will be rejected by the people. But if these ideas are an honest expression of the instincts, if they represent the true thought of the people, they will quickly penetrate the spirit of the revolting multitudes. And as long as these ideas encounter the way of the popular spirit, will advance quickly to their full, to their full realization." End quote. The specific anarchist organization, understood as a political expression of the interests of the exploited classes, does not act on their behalf and never places itself above them. It does not replace the organization of the exploited classes, but gives anarchists the chance to put themselves at their services, at their service. In this political practice of placing itself at the service of the exploited classes, the anarchist organization is guided by a charter of principles. The principles are the ethical propos propositions and notions both non-negotiable, that guide all political practice, providing models for anarchist action. Quote, the assumption of consistency with these principles is what determines ideological authenticity pertaining to anarchism. End quote. In our case, the Charter of Principles of 2003 defines nine principles, freedom, ethics, and values, federalism, self-management, internationalism, direct action, class struggle, political practice, and social insertion, and mutual aid. In first place, we assert the principles of freedom, affirming that, quote, the struggle for freedom precedes anarchy, end quote. Like Bakunin thought, we hold that, quote, individual freedom can only find its ultimate expression in collective freedom, end quote. And we reject Therefore, the individualist proposals of anarchism, the pursuit of libertarian socialism, is thus the incessant struggle for freedom. Another principle absolutely central for us is that of ethics and values, which causes us to base all of our practice on the anarchist ethic, which is a, quote, non-negotiable militant commitment, end quote. Through ethics, among other things, we advocate the consistency between means and ends and mutual respect. We assert federalism and self-management as principles of non-hierarchical and decentralized organization, sustained by mutual aid and free association. Assuming the premise of the IWA that everyone has rights and duties. Beyond this, it is these principles that will guide the management of the future society at all levels, economic, political, and social management performed by the workers themselves. Emphasizing the need for struggles to be self-managed, we affirm that, quote, even if living with the current outdated system, 
self-management gives potential to the transformations that point towards an egalitarian society, end quote. By asserting internationalism, we highlight the international character of struggles and the need for us to associate ourselves by class affinities and not, the, not those of nationality. The exploited of one country must see in the exploited of another a companion of the struggle and not an enemy. Internationalism is opposed to nationalism and the exaltation of the state, as they represent a sense of superiority over other countries and peoples and reinforce ethnocentrism and prejudice. The first steps towards xenophobia. Everyone, regardless of their nationality, is equal and should be free. Direct action is posited as a principle founded on horizontalism and encourages the protagonism of workers opposing representative democracy, which, as we have already stated, alienates politically. Direct action puts the people in front of their own decisions and actions, quote, linking workers and the oppressed to the center of political action, end quote. In addition, we choose to base ourselves on class struggle, defining ourselves as a workers organization of workers that defend the exploited and fight for the extinction of class society and for the creation of a society in which slaves and masters no longer exist. Therefore, we recognize and give precedence to the class struggle. For us, there's a central need to combat the evils of capitalism head on. And for this, it is essential to fight alongside the exploited where the consequences of class society become more clear and evident. The principles of political practice and social insertion reinforce the idea that it is only the exploited classes that anarchism is able to, that it is only with the exploited classes that anarchism is able to flourish. Therefore, the anarchist organization should seek to relate to all forms of popular struggle, regardless of where they may be taking place. We affirm that the interaction of the anarchist organization with any manifestation, quote, in the social, cultural, peasant, trade unions, student, community, environmental camps, etc., as long as inserted into the context of struggles for freedom, end quote, contemplates and concretization, contemplates the concretization of this principle. As the last principle in the charter, mutual aid, encourages solidarity and struggle, encouraging the maintenance of fraternal relations with all who truly work for a just and egalitarian world. It encourages effective solidarity among the exploited. At the moment in which it performs social work, the specific anarchist organization seeks to influence the social movements in a constructive way, with proposals and, at the same time, keep away from them the negative influence of individuals and groups who, instead of defending the interests of the people, encouraging them to be the protagonists of their own emancipation, use them to achieve their objectives. We know that politicians, parties, unions, and also other authoritarian organizations and individuals, like the church, drug trafficking, etc., constitute obstacles to the construction of the popular organization since they penetrate social movements. In the vast majority of cases, seeking to take advantage of the number of people present there to find support in elections, constitute the base for authoritarian power projects, get money, conquer faiths, open new markets, and so on. Authoritarian organizations and individuals do not want to support social movements but use them to achieve their, the authoritarian organizations and individuals, own objectives, which are not consistent with the objectives of the militants of the social movements. That is, the authoritarians seek to, seek to, re seek to establish a relationship of domination over the social movements. Any anarchist who has organized or even seen how working in social movements works knows that if there's not a consistent organization capable of giving the necessary strength to the anarchists in the ongoing dispute over political space, the authoritarians become hegemonic and the work of the anarchists is completely lost. 
The anarchists, by not constituting the necessary social force, offer two possibilities. Either they will be used by the authoritarians as workhorses, aka sleeves, in carrying out their authoritarian power projects, or they will simply be removed. In the first case, we speak of anarchists that are not specifically organized and go in the wake of events. When they are not organized, they do not exert the necessary influence to have an, even a little social force. While they do not interfere much, they are allowed in the social they are allowed in the social movements. In the second case, we speak of isolated anarchists who begin to exert some influence, or, in authoritarian understanding, they begin to interfere. In, the, in this case, they are expelled, removed, or vilified. They are literally bowled over by the authoritarians. Without the necessary organization, they cannot maintain themselves in these social movements, and much less exert the desired influence. This happens because when there is not a proper organization of anarchists, it's possible to establish authoritarian or less libertarian organizations. In addressing the permanent dispute over political space, we're not saying that anarchists should fight for the leadership, supervision, or any position of privilege in the social movements. We talk, on the contrary, of the internal struggle that takes place when we want to influence social movements to use libertarian practices. We believe that there is never a political vacuum anywhere. Therefore, from the moment we cause our positions to prevail, it, is necessarily, it necessarily means a decrease in the influence of the authoritarians and vice versa. For example, on seeing that some anarchists are struggling for a movement to use direct action and direct democracy, politicians and party devices will be against it. And unless there's a strong organization of anarchists with social insertion and the ability to fight for these positions, the authoritarian positions will have greater chance to be will have greater chances to prosper. When we are properly organized as anarchists, we will not lag behind events but manage to mark our positions and exert our influence in the social movements, going on to have true insertion. It is through the specific anarchist organization that we can manage to be properly organized for the work we want to perform in the most varying social movements. Quote, the anarchist organization should be the continuation of our efforts and our propaganda. It must be the libertarian advisor that guides us in our everyday combat action. We can base ourselves on its program to spread our action in other camps, in all the special organizations of particular struggles into which we can penetrate and take our activity and action. For example, in the trade unions, in anti-militarist societies, in anti-religious and anti-clerical groupings, etc., our special organization can serve equally as ground for anarchist concentration, not centralized, as a field of agreement, of understanding, and of the most complete solidarity as possible between us. The more we are united, the smaller will be the danger that we, that we be dragged into incoherence, or that we turn from our impetus for struggle to battles and skirmishes where others who are not at all in agreement with us could tie our hands, end quote. Thus, the anarchist organization, besides being responsible for its political practice in different camps, serves to increase the social force of the anarchists within them. Among the various forces present in these spaces, anarchists should stand out and bring to fruition their positions. This political practice in different camps requires that the anarchist organization divides itself into fronts, which are the internal groups that carry out social work. Generally, organizations that work with this methodology suggest that three basic fronts are developed, trade union, community, and student. Differently, we believe that the fronts should be divided, not according to these pre-stipulated spaces of, of insertion, but based on the practical work of the organization. In our understanding, there should not be an obligation to develop work in these three fronts, and, in addition, there may be other interesting spaces that demand dedicated fronts. 
each organization should seek spaces more conducive to the development of its social work and from this practical necessity from its fronts. Thus, there is, thus if there is work in the student sector, there may be a student front. If there is union work, there may be a trade union front. However, if other, if other work is developed, for example, with rural movements or with urban movements, etc., the front should follow this division. That is, instead of having only one community front that works with rural and urban social movements, you could create a front of rural movements and another front of urban movements. In this sense, we support a model of dynamic fronts that account for the internal division of the specific anarchist organization for the practical realization of social work in the best way possible. The fronts are responsible in their respective area of work for the creation and development of social movements, as well as for ensuring that anarchists occupy political space, space that in, is in permanent dispute, and to exercise due influence in these movements. In the case of our organization, we initiated social work divided into two fronts, the community front, which combines the work of management of the Fabio Luis Social Library, of the Center of Social, uh, of Social Culture of Rio de Janeiro, and its community work, the Marques de Costa Centre for Research, and of the Ideal Perez Libertarian Study Circle. The other was the Occupations Front, which was involved with urban occupations and the internationalist front of the homeless. With the change in the situation, we left FIST, continuing to work with occupations and have gone on to bring together a few occupiers and many other unemployed in the movement of unemployed workers. This movement took on great importance in this front. In this way, the Occupations Front was renamed Urban Social Movements Front. Likewise, because we deemed it necessary, we constituted a third front, the agro-ecological front, anarchism and nature from practical work and from practical work in rural social movements of ecology and agriculture, which began to, to be developed by the organization. In this way, we hold that the fronts are adapted to the practical context of work. We illustrate how this works in practice. Diagram one. SAO being the specific anarchist organization, divided into fronts A, B, and C, and SM, the social movements, the SAO is divided internally into the fronts which act each one in a determined SM or SM sector. In this case, assuming that the SAO works with three SM or with three SM sectors, it divides itself for the work in three fronts. Front A works with SMA, or with Sector A of a determined SM. Front B works with SMB, or with Sector B of a determined SM, and so on. Giving practical examples, the SAO can be divided into a syndicalist front, A, a community front, B, and a student front, C. And each one of them will act in a... a in an SM. Front A will act in the union, front B in the community, and C in the student movement. In our case, our SAO is divided into three fronts, urban social movements, A, community, B, and agroecology, anarchism and nature, C. Each of these works in one or more social movements, front A in the homeless movement and in the MTD, front B in the community movement, and front C in the rural movements of ecology and agriculture. Besides this internal division into fronts, which functions for social work, the specific anarchist organization uses, both for its internal and external functioning, the logic of what we call concentric circles, strongly inspired by the, uh, by the, Bakuninist, con by the Bakuninist organizational model. The main reason that we adopt this logic of functioning is because for us, 
the anarchist organization needs to preserve different instances of action. These different instances should strengthen its work while at the same time allowing it to bring together prepared militants with a high level of commitment and approximating people sympathetic to the theory or practice of the organization, who could be more or less prepared and more or less committed. In short, the concentric circles seek to resolve an important paradox. The anarchist organization needs to be closed enough to have prepared, committed, and politically aligned militants, and open enough to draw in new militants. A large part of the problems that occur in anarchist organizations are caused by them not functioning according to the logic of concentric circles and by not implementing these two instances of action. Should a person who says they are an anarchist and is interested in the works of the organization be in the organization, despite not knowing the political line in depth? Should a layman interested in anarchist ideas be in the organization? How do you relate to libertarians in the broadest sense of the term who do not consider themselves anarchists? Should they be in the organization? And the older members who have already done important work but now want to be close, but not to engage in the permanent activities of the organization. And those that only rarely dedicate time or for activism. There are many questions. Other problems occur because there are doubts about the implementation of social work. Must the organization present itself as an anarchist organization in the social movements? In its social work, can it form alliances with other individuals, groups, and organizations that are not anarchists? In such a case, what are the common points to advocate? How do you carry out social work in the field with people from different ideologies and maintain an anarchist identity? How do you ensure that anarchism does not lose its identity when, it, when in contact with social movements? On this point, there are also many questions. The concentric circles are intended to provide a clear place for each of the militants and sympathizers of the organization. In addition, they seek to facilitate and strengthen the social work of the anarchist organization, and finally, establish a channel for the capture of new militants. In practice, the logic of concentric circles is established as follows. Inside the specific anarchist organization, there are only anarchists that, to a greater or lesser extent, are able to elaborate, reproduce, and apply the political line of the organization internally, in the fronts, and in public activity. Also, to a greater or lesser extent, militants should be able to assist in the elaboration of the strategic tactical line of the organization, as well as having full capacity to reproduce and apply it. Militants assume internal functions in the organization, be they executive, deliberative, or extraordinary, as well as external functions with regards to social work. The functions assumed by the militants within the organization adhere to self-management and federalism, or to horizontal decisions where all the militants have the same power of voice and of vote, and where, in specific cases, there is delegation with imperative mandates. The functions to be per performed by the delegates must be very well defined so that they, quote, cannot act on behalf, so that they cannot act on behalf of the association unless the members thereof have explicitly authorized them to do so. They should execute only what the members have decided and not dictate the way forward to the association, end quote. Moreover, the functions should be rotated in order to empower everyone and avoid crystallized positions or functions. The specific anarchist organization could have only one circle of militants, all of them being in the same instance, or it could have more than one circle, the criteria being collectively de defined. For example, this may be the time that a person has been in the organization or their ability to elaborate the political or tactical strategic lines. Thus, the newer militants or those with a lesser ability to elaborate the lines may be in a more external, distant circle with the more experienced militants with a greater ability for elaborating the lines in another more internal, closer one. There's not a hierarchy between the circles 
But the idea is that the more inside or the closer the militant, the better are they able to formulate, understand, reproduce, and apply the lines of the organization. The more inside the militant, the greater is their level of commitment and activity. The more a militant offers the organization, the more is demanded of them by it. It is the militants who decide on their level of commitment, and they do or do not participate in the instances of deliberation based on this choice. Thus, the militants decide how they want to commit, and the more they commit, the more they will decide. The less they commit, the less they will decide. This does not mean that the position of the more committed is of more value than that of the less committed. It means that they participate in different decision-making bodies. For example, those who those more committed participate with voice and vote in the Congresses, which define the political and strategic lines of the organization. The less committed do not participate in the Congresses or only participate as observers and participate in the monthly assemblies where the tactics and practical applications of the lines are defined. Thus, inside the specific anarchist organization, you may have one or more circles, which should always be defined by the level of commitment of the militants. In the case of more than one level, this must be clear to everyone, and the criteria to change a level must be available to all militants. It is therefore the militant who chooses where they want to be. The next circle, more external and distant from the core of the anarchist organization, is no longer part of the organization, but has a fundamental importance. The level of supporter. This body or instance seeks to group together all people who have ideological affinities with the anarchist organization. Supporters are responsible for assisting the organization in its practical work such as the publishing of pamphlets, periodicals or books, the dissemination of propaganda material, helping in the work of producing theory or of contextual analysis, in the organization of practical activities for social work, community activities, helping in training work, logistical activities, help in organizing work, etc. This instance of support is where people who have affinities with the anarchist organization and its work have contact with other militants, are able to deepen their knowledge of the political line of the organization, better get to know its activities, and deepen their vision of anarchism, etc. Therefore, the category of support has an important role to help the anarchist organization put into practice its activities, seeking to bring those interested closer to it. This approximation has a future objective that some of the supporters will become militants of the organization. The specific anarchist organization draws in the greatest possible number of supporters and, through practical work, identifies those interested in joining the organization and who have an appropriate profile for membership. The proposal for entry into the organization may be made by the, militant, by the militants of the organization to the supporter and vice versa. Although each militant chooses their level of commitment to the organization and where they want to be, the objective of the anarchist organization is always to have the greatest number of militants in the, in the more internal circles with a greater level of commitment. Let us have a practical example. Let's suppose that an organization has deliberated to work internally with two levels of commitment, or two circles. When the militants are new, they enter at the, the level of militant, and when they have been there six months, are prepared and committed militants, move on to the level of full militant. Let us suppose that this organization has also resolved to have a level of supporters. The objective of the organization will be to draw in the greatest possible number of supporters based on the affinity of each one of the organization each one with the organization, transferring them to the level of militant and, after six months, once prepared, to the level of full militant. We illustrate how this can work in practice. Diagram 2. SU being the level of supporters, M of militants, and FM of full militants, the objective is the flow indicated by the red arrow 
to go from SU to M and from M to FM. Those who are interested can follow this flow and those who are not can stay where they feel better. For example, if a person wants to give sporadic support and no more than that, they, must, they, they may want to always stay at SU. The issue here is that all a person's will to work should be utilized by the organization. This is not because a person has little time or because they prefer to help at a time when it must be rejected, but because inside a specific anarchist organization, there must be room for all those who wish to contribute. Quote, Accomplishment, accomplishments are the criteria for selection that never fail. The aptitude and efficiency of the militants are fundamentally measures for the enthusiasm and the application with which they perform their tasks." End quote. The logic of concentric circles requires that each militant and the organization itself have very well-defined rights and duties for each level of commitment. This is because it is not just for someone to make but to make decisions about something with which they will not comply. A supporter who frequents activities once a month and makes sporadic contributions, for example, cannot decide on rules or activities that must be met or carried out daily, as they would be deciding something much more for the other militants than for themselves. It is a very common practice in, a libertarian, in libertarian groups that people who make sporadic contributions decide on issues which end up being committed to or carried out by the more permanent members. It is very easy for a militant who appears from time to time to want to set the political line of the organization. And for example, since it is not they who will have to follow this line most of the time. These are disproportionate forms of decision-making in which one ends up deciding something which others enact. In the model of concentric circles, we seek a system of rights and duties in which everyone makes decisions about that which they could and should be committed to afterwards. In this way, it is normal for supporters to decide only on that in which they will be involved. In the same way, it is normal for militants of the organization to decide on that which they will carry out. Thus, we make decisions and their commitments proportionally, and this implies that the organization has clear criteria for entry, clearly defining who does and does not take part in it, and at what level of commitment the militants are. An important criteria for entry is that all of the militants who enter the organization must agree with its political line. For this, the anarchist organization must have theoretical material that expresses this line. In less depth for those who are not yet members of the organization, and in more depth for those who are. When someone is interested in the work of the anarchist organization, showing interest in approximation, you should make this person a supporter and give them the necessary guidance. As a supporter, knowing the political line in a little more depth and having an affinity for the practical work of the organization, the person may show interest in joining the organization or the organization can express its interest in the, support in the supporter becoming a militant. In both cases, the supporter should receive permanent guidance from the anarchist organization, giving to them theoretical material that will deepen their political line. One or more militants who know this line well will discuss doubts, debate, and make clarifications with them. Having secured the agreement of the supporter with the political line of the organization and with agreement from both parties, the militant is integrated into the organization. It is important that in the initial period, every new militant has the guidance of another older one who will orient and prepare them for work. In any event, the anarchist organization always has to concern itself with the training and guidance of the supporters and militants so that this may allow them to change their level of commitment if they so desire. The same logic of concentric circles works in social work. Through it, the anarchist organization is articulated to perform social work in the most appropriate and effective way. 
As we have seen, the anarchist organization is divided internally into fronts for the performance of practical work. For this, there are organizations that prefer to establish direct relations with the social movement. And there are others that prefer to present themselves through an intermediary social organization, which we could call a grouping of tendency. Quote, participation in the groupings in the grouping of tendency implies acceptance of a set of definitions that can be shared by comrades of diverse ideological origins, but which share certain indispensable exclusions to the reformists, for example, if seeking a minimum level of real operational coherence, the groupings of tendency coordinated with each other and rooted in the most combative of the people are a higher level than that, than the latter, the level of the masses." End quote. The grouping of tendency puts itself between the social movements and the specific anarchist organization, bringing together militants of distinct ideologies that have affinity in relation to certain practical questions. As we have emphasized, there are anarchist organizations that prefer to present themselves directly in the social movements without the need for the groupings of tendency, and others preferring to present themselves by means of these. In both cases, there are positive and negative points, and each organization must determine the best way to act. As the views that we advocate in the social movements are much more practical than theoretical, it may be interesting to work with a grouping of tendency, incorporating people who agree with some or all of the positions that we advocate in the social movements, force, class struggle, autonomy, combativeness, direct action, direct democracy, and revolutionary perspective, and that will help us to augment the social force in defense of these positions. In the same way as the diagram above, the idea is that the specific anarchist organization seeks insertion in this intermediate level, grouping of tendency, and through it presents itself conducting its work in social movements in search of social insertion. Again, we illustrate how this works in practice. Diagram three. Sal being the specific anarchist organization, GT, the grouping of tendency, and SM, the social movement. There are two flows. The first, that of the influence of the SAL, seeks to go through the GT and from there to the SM. Let us look at a few practical examples. The anarchist organization that desires to act in a union may form a grouping of tendency with other activists from the union movement who defend some specific banners, revolutionary perspective, direct action, etc. And by means of this tendency, may influence the union movement or the union in which it acts. Or the anarchist organization may choose to work with the landless movement and for this brings people who defend similar positions, autonomy, direct democracy, etc. in the social movement together in a grouping of tendency. By means of this grouping of tendency, the specific anarchist organization acts within the landless movement and in this way seeks to influence it. This form of organization aims to solve a very common problem that we find in activism. For example, when we know very dedicated activists, revolutionaries that advocate self-management, autonomy, grassroots democracy, direct democracy, etc., and with whom we do not act because they are not anarchists. These activists could work with the anarchists in grouping of, groupings of tendency and defend their positions in the social movements together. The second arrow in the diagram shows the objective of the flow of militants. That is, in this, in this schema of work, the goal is to bring people in the social movements that have practical affinity with the anarchists into groupings of tendency, and from there, bring those that have ideological affinity closer to the anarchist organization. In the same way as in the previous diagram, if a militant has a great practical affinity with the anarchists, but is not an anarchist, they must be a member of the grouping of tendency, and will be fundamental to the performance of social work. If they have ideological affinities, 
they may be closer to or even join the organization. The objective of the anarchist organization is not to turn all activists into anarchists, but to learn to work with each of these activists in the most appropriate way. While having mutual interests, the militants may change their positions in the circles, from the social movement to the grouping of tendency, or from the grouping of tendency to the anarchist organization. Without these mutual interests, however, each one acts where they think it more pertinent. The decision-making process used in the anarchist organization is an attempt at consensus, using the vote when consensus is not possible. Unlike some libertarian groups and organizations, we believe that consensus should not be mandatory. As we mentioned earlier, besides consensus being a very inefficient form of decision-making, becoming unfeasible the more the number of people involved in the decision increases, it offers the serious problem of giving great power to isolated agents. In an organization of 20 militants, one could block consensus, or even if 19 were in favor of one position and one, an and one another, you would have to have a middle ground that would consider in a very disproportionate way the only dissenter. To give proper efficiency to the decision-making process and not to give too much power to isolated agents, we choose this model of an attempt at consensus, and when this is not possible, the vote. Quote, if it were in the very bosom of the organization that the disagreement arose, that the division between majority and minority ap appeared around minor issues, over practical modalities, or over special cases, then it may occur more or less easily that the minority are inclined to do as the majority. End quote. In the case of voting, all the militants of the organization, even those who are outvoted, have an obligation to follow the winning position. This decision-making process is used to establish theoretical and ideological unity, and also for strategic and tactical unity. We will return to these later. At this point, it is enough to emphasize that for the struggle we want to pursue, we must put an end to dis to dispersion and disorganization, and, quote, the way to overcome this is to create an organization that is based on the basis of specific theoretical and tactical positions, and that leads us to firm understanding of how these should be applied in practice, end quote. It is important to add, too, that the militants must use common sense at the time of decisions by vote. They should clearly observe the positions of militants who are closest to the issues that are being voted on, as these positions are more important than those who are not close, even though they have the same weight in voting. When voting occurs, it can be easy for militants to not for militants not involved in the issue being voted on to determine what others will have to do. Such situations demand caution, and those in which all the members that would carry out what was deliberated on lose the vote and are obliged to apply what was resolved by others should be avoided. Also, in relation to decisions at the time in which they are being taken, quote, there must be a lot of space for all discussions and all points of view must be analyzed carefully, end quote. After de deliberation, quote, responsibilities are divided, the members being formally responsible for their execution, end quote since, quote, the organization does nothing by itself, end quote. Then, quote, all the activities that are deliberated and which are the responsibility of the organization will have, in one way or another, to be executed by its members, end quote. And for this execution, there is the, quote, need to divide the activities between militants, always looking for a model that distributes these activities well and to avoid the con concentration of tasks of, on the more active or capable members." End quote. quote. From the moment in which a militant res assumes one or more tasks for the organization, he has an obligation to perform them in a great responsibility to the group. 
It is the relationship of commitment that the militant assumes with the organization. End quote. Furthermore, we believe it to be relevant and reaffirm once again that, quote, self-discipline is the engine of the self-managed organization, end quote. And this also applies to the specific anarchist organization. Thus, quote, each one that assumes a responsibility must have sufficient discipline to execute it. Likewise, when the organization determines a line to follow or something to accomplish, it is individual discipline that will cause what is collectively resolved to be realized, end quote. We note, quote, we also ask for discipline because without understanding, without coordinating the efforts of each one into a common and simultaneous action, victory is not physically possible. But discipline should not be a servile discipline, a blind devotion to leaders, an obedience to the one who always says not to interfere. Revolutionary discipline is consistent with the ideas accepted fidelity to commitments assumed, it is to feel obliged to share the work and the risks with struggle and the risks with struggle comrades, end quote. Quote, we believe that in order for our struggle to bear promising fruit, it is fundamental that each of the militants of the organization have a high degree of commitment, responsibility, and self-discipline, end quote. Quote, it is will and militant commitment that will cause us to go day after day towards the development of the organization's activities, such that we can overcome the obstacles and pave the way for our long-term objectives, end quote. Finally, we should know that, quote, responsibility and organizational discipline should not horrify. They are travel companions of the practice of social anarchism. End quote. This position introduces a relation of co-responsibility between the militants and the organization. It being that the anarchist organization, quote, will be responsible for the revolutionary and political activity of each member, the same way as each member will be responsible for the revolutionary and political activity, end quote, of the anarchist organization.